Welcome back, Spartans. This past week saw the release of Halo Broken Circle, and I cannot wait to share my thoughts with you. Broken Circle is the book I have been waiting for for a long time. Delving into the history of the Covenant and taking a new look at the Great Schism, Broken Circle seems to be a guaranteed hit. And you know what? It is. While I'm reluctant to call the book perfect, Broken Circle is an exciting story from start to finish. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. Warning, spoilers ahead, as always. Our story starts near the end of the Sanchayum Sanghili War in the year 860 BCE. A Sanchayum, Umkenskra Aben, lands on the planet known as the Planet of Blue and Red, named so for the blue and red stars in orbits. Umken is there to secure the safety of a Sanchayum science team studying Forerunner relics. Using Forerunner machines from the Dreadnought, Umken keeps an eye out for enemy Sanghili, and it isn't long before he spots some. The leader of these forces, Usa Zelus, is known to Umken as a fierce warrior. Initially marking him for assassination, Mken decides that Usa could be useful for information gathering or even as a tool for securing a Sanghili surrender, and marks Usa instead for capture. Using Sentinels to draw the Sanghili forces into a more opportune position, Mken soon finds himself the target of Sanghili assassins who had used secret tunnels to ambush the San Shayum. Mken is lucky to make his escape, ordering the science team to withdraw and the Dreadnought to fire on the Forerunner's sight. It seems that the Forerunner keyship is actually able to gauge its output, meaning that it can fire on sights, killing enemy combatants while leaving relics intact. In certain situations, of course. Usa Zealous foresees this and orders his troops into the aforementioned secret tunnels. Most are killed, but Usa and a few others survive. So, before we continue, let's address a slight... Let's call it a nitpick I have. And let's be clear, this really is a nitpick at best. The Sanghili already having plasma weaponry. Yeah. Nitpick. Really, this stems from my own headcanon, for to be honest. I had always imagined that the Sanghili, during the time of the Sanchayum Sanghili War, had used projectile weapons, be that something like what the UNSC had or something slightly more advanced. To the book's credit, though, they do address this. So, time for a quick history lesson. The Sanchayum we know in Halo are descended from a group known as the Reformists. About 4,000 years or so prior to the Human Covenant War, the Reformists, defying the norm of their society, entered the Forerunner key ship that had been left on Jean Quom, the San Shayum homeworld. Soon after, due to threats presented by the Stoics, San Shayum who believed Forerunner relics shouldn't be messed with, the Reformists activated the key ship and left, taking a huge chunk of Jean Quom with them. More than a millennia later, the San Shayum encountered the Sanghili on one of their colonies. The Sanghili were much like the Stoics of old and war broke out between the two species. The Sanghili had military might, but the San Shayum had the Forerunner keyship, called the Dreadnought, and not to be confused with an actual Dreadnought-class Forerunner ship, and all the marvels it held. As the war raged, what could be called the Sanghili equivalent of the Illuminati, and I'm talking about the real Illuminati, not the conspiracy theory bullshit Illuminati, came out of hiding, revealing that they had been studying Forerunner artifacts and making advancements in secret for years. With the war with the San Shayum raging, the Sanghili were eager to use these new advancements. The only remaining problem, read, again, nitpick, is that Sanghili armor apparently didn't advance alongside their weapons. Sanghili armor is being described as metal atop leather, basically medieval knight armor. Well, with all that aside, let's move on. Our story jumps forward nine years to 851 BCE. The chunk from Janjir Qualm is being hollowed out, soon to be the covenant holy city of high charity. The dreadnought eventually placed within, decommissioned as part of the writ of union. While most Sanghili have taken the writ and joined the covenant, some have not. Notably, Usa Zealous. Within the Dreadnought, Mken, now known as the Prophet of Inner Conviction, meets with a couple other Sanchayum and Sanghili to discuss Usa and his capture or death. And sorry to stop again, but one other very, very minor nitpick. There's so much focus and talk about the Writ of Union in this book, I was actually pretty disappointed that we never got to see the full Writ of Union. Another time, perhaps. It's also interesting to note that, as of the formation of the Covenant, the Sanchayum have come to call the Sanghili elites, and the Sanghili call the Sanchayum prophets. While the latter makes sense, it's kind of weird that the Sanchayum would have the same name for the Sanghili as humanity did. Hell, we learn later in the book that many of the human designations for the Covenant species are the same among the Covenant themselves. Ungoy or Grunts, Ungala Golo or Hunters, Yanmea or Drones, etc. In fact, the only species that doesn't seem to have a nickname are the Kigyar, if they do, it's never mentioned. I guess it just seems like a really weird coincidence. Meanwhile, on a Sanghili colony known as Krek, we find Usa and his mate, Sul, looking to recruit for their cause. It's not long before they come across someone looking to help, an old Sanghili and the one for which the colony was named, Kreka. To prove himself, Kreka reveals the location of a Forerunner Shield world he discovered decades ago. Now, 
This story of how Kraka discovered the Shield World is actually really interesting for a number of reasons. First, it's set before the start of the Sanchayum Sanghili War. Of recent interest in the comments section of some of my videos and among the Halo community in general has been the longevity of the Sanghili. Here we see that Kreka was an active warrior as long as 87 years ago. Admittedly, Usa doesn't believe that Kreka is who he claims to be at first, but this story still seems to give credence to the idea that the Sanghili live much longer than humans, or at least remain combat capable for years longer than the average human would. Second is how he discovered the Shield World. It seems that almost a century ago, Kreka's ship was attacked by unknown assailants in the System of Miasmic Giants, leaving him the only survivor. Escaping via slipspace, Kreka stumbled upon the Shield World. Intrigued, he entered the artificial fortress and found himself confronted by the world's AI, Enduring Bias. Bias wanted to use Kreka for study and Kreka, confused, fled. It was not long after that he discovered the world that would become Krek. He never told anyone else this story because, at the time, and up until very recently in their society, entering the Shield World could have been seen as heresy. Third, the system of miasmic giants. The existence of this system begs a very big question. What was the species that attacked Kreka's ship? Was it one of the future client species of the Covenant? The Letgolo were Tier 3 by the time they encountered the Covenant in 784 BCE, the same technology tier as humanity in 2552, so them being capable of shooting down a Sanghili ship sometime around the mid 900 BCEs isn't impossible. And of course, the Letgolo are capable of merging into what could be called giants in the form of Mga Letgolo. Or could it be the Sharkwi? This species was recently confirmed to still be a part of the Halo canon, and based on the existing concept art and renders we have, they are certainly gigantic creatures. Or could it be some new species? Some people have speculated that it might be the species that crash landed on Installation 04 in the CEA terminals, and of course it could be something else we've never encountered. It's certainly an exciting mystery that I really hope pays off in some future media. Fourth, Enduring Bias. For one thing, there's his appearance, described as vaguely octagonal with three glowing lenses or eyes. Sound familiar? There's also the name. Why Bias? All Forerunner Ancilla with Bias in their name have always been Contender Class. Does this mean that Enduring Bias is a contender, or has some relationship to Mendicant or Offensive Bias? Or is it just a coincidence? Finally, there's the Shield World itself. As we learn through the course of the book, this Shield World, 0673, was the last one to be built and had a lot of experimental technologies. What's really interesting is that this Shield World has a number of features very reminiscent of Requiem, notably multiple layers and shells. We've already passed through one layer of the planet's surface. It's not crazy to think that someone else made it deeper inside than we did. Most shield worlds being more like hollowed out planets, and the strange stalactite-like structures. All very interesting, though sadly many of these questions I've presented aren't answered in the book at all. I can only hope that Halo 2 Anniversary's terminals or some other future Halo media will address them. Moving forward, Usa, Suln, and Krek inspect the shield world and, with enduring Bias's permission, Bias himself malfunctioning, lonely, and no longer hostile, Usa decides to move his people there. At their hiding place on Sanghelios, Usa announces the news and his people begin to pack up. One Sanghili, Verticus, asks for a specific location, and when Usa refuses, Verticus reveals himself to be an assassin and strikes at Usa. The assassin is struck down by a close Sanghili friend named Ernica the Scarmaker and ripped apart by a number of Usa's followers. With no other distractions, Usa and his people move out. Before we move on, let's look at another couple oddities in this book. For one, we have some Sanghili names. Verticus and Ernica as two I've named, plus another in the book named Muskem. They're all pretty long for Sanghili names based on the ones we've seen before. Of course, this is set more than 3,000 years in the past, so Sanghili names can evolve over time. It's also noteworthy that no Sanghili named thus far have the honorific EE at the end of their name, which denotes Covenant military service. It's obviously expected for the Rebels, but even Covenant soldiers seem to lack the EE. The only one with it is one we meet later, Vel Kathami. It's never really explained, which does kind of bother me. Also of interest is a new Sanghili weapon called the Burn Blade. It's a metal blade with a heating mechanism inside. It sounds a lot like a precursor to the energy sword we see in the Halo games, and is even manufactured on Kikost, one of Sanghelios' moons. This is also the location where the energy sword would eventually be manufactured. Anyway, our story once again jumps forward, this time by a year to 850 BCE. On the Shield World, now known as the Refuge, Usa and his followers are starting a new life as best they can. Living off a combination of veggies and synthesized meat, many a day are spent scanning various Forerunner relics in hopes of understanding their new home. All the while, Usa and Sun talking directly to Enduring Bias. 
Through the Ancilla, they learn that the refuge has a new, albeit untested, feature to disassemble, this being what we see on the cover of this book. Later, a trio of Sangheili, Tersa Gunok, Salas Krolon, and Drem hear about this during an interaction with Enduring Bias. Tersa, able to be logical, understands that it's just a feature, while Krolon and Drem go crazy thinking Usa is trying to kill them all. Things are only made worse when Bias brings up the need for Huragok. Tersa happens to mention that the Sanchayum have some, and Bias notes that he would love if the Sanchayum were to show up. Naturally, Bias just means he wants something to repair the refuge and himself, not necessarily to betray his Sangheili guests. Of course, this goes straight over Krolon and Drem's heads. Meanwhile, High Charity has been completed enough that the Dreadnought has been decommissioned and the Sanchayum are living in the future Holy City. Umken is informed of Usa's escape and disappearance, the Prophet noting that little more can be done at this time. With one order of business done, Umken is pulled into another. He's informed that an old rival, Erno Custo, has been made the head of a new ministry, the Ministry of Anticipatory Security, by the Hierarch Excellent Redolence, with whom Umken has a bad history. A while back, Umken went to the other Hierarchs when he found out that Excellent wanted to kidnap female stock from Janjir Kwom. Naturally, Excellent now wants Umken to head a team to recover female Sangheili from Janjir Kwom, albeit this time they're volunteers, along with some legendary Forerunner artifacts. Due to Umken having used his political power to avoid being added to the role of celibates in the past, and his wife apparently being pregnant, Excellent and Urno now have some hold over Umken, forcing him to accept the task. Before we move on, let's talk about the role of celibates. When the Sanchayum reformists left Janjir Kwom, strict breeding policies were put in place to prevent disastrous inbreeding. The role of celibates, a list of Sanchayum no longer allowed to breed, was part of these policies. As should be expected from Sanchayum, the role has since been turned into a tool of political and bureaucratic blackmail. So, Umken with a team of two Sanchayum, six Sangheili, and one Huragak head to Janjir Kwom. While not exactly happy with his situation, Umken is eager to discover the new artifacts. Once in orbit, Umken leaves for the surface with what would basically be a precursor to the Phantom Dropship, with one Sanchayum, Thervam Lakosor, two Sanghili, Phil Kathami, and Loquen Umvong, and the Huragak floats near ceiling. Under the cover of night, the group heads into the Grotto of the Great Transition where the legendary artifacts are said to be stored. They soon come to a cave in a cliff face, a carving above it confirming it to be an entrance to an area of great importance. It's interesting to note what this carving depicts. It's described as ancient Sanchayum alongside an unknown hominid species. This is, of course, a reference to the ancient alliance between humanity and Sanchayum during the time of the Forerunners. Upon entering the cave, the group is disappointed to find nothing. However, Vil suggests, to Umken's surprise and admiration, that the true entrance may be hidden. Floats quickly confirms this. Accessing an interface only meant to be accessed by a Hurugak, a Forerunner artifact known as the Purifying Vision is revealed. This is in fact a holographic representation of a Halo Ring, with a general overview of the ring and a flyover of the landscape. With further help from Floats, the group opens up a wall to reveal a secret chamber holding a second artifact, a Luminary, this Luminary in specific holding the location of the Halo Rings. With all seeming to go well, you know the sudden and inevitable betrayal is just around the corner. Fervum and Loquen reveal that they had been told to kill Umken and Vil and take any artifacts they found. Though Umken had been expecting such betrayal, he found the weapons in his gravity throne had been disabled, and a firefight quickly breaks out. Umken and Vil fall back into the secret chamber and have Floats seal it from within. Before it closes, Vil fires out of the cave, attracting the attention of native Sanchayum that had been stalking them. When Umken and Vil suspect that the natives had either killed or dragged off Vervum and Loquen, they retrieve the Luminary and Vision and head back to their dropship. After quickly explaining that Vervum and Loquen had been killed by the natives, of course leaving out the part about the betrayal, the group heads to a nearby village called Krelum, where nine Sanchayum females are waiting to be taken off-planet. What initially seems to be an easy pickup quickly goes south when Sanchayum males, literally riding living foliage, arrive to fuck shit up. I think now is a pretty good time to talk about the truly alien life and culture on Janjir Kwom. Janjir Kwom features a number of plants that seem to be literally alive. One plant is described as basically being a flower with an eye. There are other plants that absorb sunlight by day and give off light by night, pretty much bioluminescence. Stranger still is the culture of the Stoic Sanchayum. Due to their beliefs regarding messing with forerunner technology, they have purposely stagnated themselves technologically speaking. They have projectile weapons and even a few satellites, but basically live in mud and stick huts. Instead of steeds or vehicles, they have bioengineered plants that almost literally grow steeds anywhere on the ground. It's absolutely crazy and pretty damn cool. Janjir Kwum is a truly alien world. Anyway, after a brief fight leaving one Sangheili dead and the others in Umken injured, the group returns to their dropship with the females and finally returns to their orbiting corvette. 
Though they are temporarily stalled due to Vervum having locked the controls, all seems to be going well otherwise. Until a missile blows a hole in their ship, while not crippling, the hole is near where the dropship and Luminary are, and not far from where the Sanshayum females are. Umken has the females moved while he tries to retrieve the Luminary before it's sucked into space. Unfortunately, one of the females, injured during the battle with the males on Janjir Kwom, had fallen behind and finds herself in an airlock with Umken. Umken then has a choice, he can either save the Luminary or the female. He chooses the female, leaving the Luminary to be sucked out of the hole and into space. Upon returning to High Charity, he is berated for his loss of the Luminary, and, due to Excellent's hands and the betrayal by Vervum, Excellent is eager to have Umken punished before he can say anything. Only through the actions of one of Umken's friends, a former Hierarch, is Umken spared and blamed for Vervum's actions shifted to Urno. Back on the refuge, things are not going very well for Tursa. When considering turning over Krolon and Drem, the two confront him, threatening to take Tursa down with them if he tells Usa of their treasonous words. Tursa initially protests, but soon realizes that it would be his word against theirs. Later, as Tursa is enjoying the company of a very bold Sanghili female, you know, let's just stop here for a moment and really compliment this book on its strong female Sanghili. I know I haven't talked about them much in this review, but the characters of Sul and Zealous and Lenore Mole really stand out. Strong, independent, capable females. A vast improvement over the piss-poor attempt by Karen Travis in the Kilo 5 books. Anyway, as Tursa and Lenore are hanging out, they discover that Krolon and Drem are spreading their treacherous thoughts. Krolon and Drem notice the two young Sanghili and give chase. Tursa and Lenore are able to escape but make the mistake of leaving Drem alive. With little choice, Krolon and Drem go to Usa and try to claim that Tursa and Lenore were the ones speaking of treachery. Thankfully, with the help of enduring bias and the numerous recording devices throughout the refuge, Krolon and Drem's deceit is revealed. Drem dies trying to avoid execution, and Krolon is taken into custody. Unfortunately, he escapes during the night. Krolon heads straight for High Charity, hoping to apologize and avoid execution by revealing the location of Usa Zealous. The Hierarchs decide to entertain this for the time, though they really have no intention of letting Krolon outlive his usefulness. They assign Mken to retrieve or kill Usa, ideally without harming the Shield World. Taking a fleet, Umken heads for what is now being called the Usan system to confront the heretic leader. Once outside the refuge, Umken decides that sincerity is the best course of action and genuinely pleads with Usa to surrender, promising to do all he can to ensure the safety of his people, though noting that, no matter what, Usa and Sul will be executed. Usa declines and decides to use the experimental disassembly feature. The technology makes it appear as though the shield world had exploded, though secretly Usa and his people survived in various sections. Though Umken secretly suspects that Usa may have survived the apparent explosion, he feels to leave well enough alone and orders his fleet to return to high charity. Our story once again flash forwards, this time to 2552, not long after the death of the High Prophet of Regret, but before the changing of the Guard. Our new focus is split between the descendant of Umken Skraaben, Zoresken slash the Prophet of Clarity, and Usa Zealous's descendant, Baltol Zealous. On High Charity, we are introduced to Zoe talking to two Sanghili about recent events, notably the death of Regret and what it could mean for the Sanghili's standing within the Covenant. Zoe, like his ancestor, comes off as truthful and honest, especially for a San Shayum. Moreover, he's very friendly with Sanghili, often dropping formal titles during candid conversations. After briefly talking with his Sanghili compatriots, Zoe is off to serve the High Prophet of Truth, as is his job. When asked if he might report on any changes he learns about Sanghili's standing, he promises to try. Within the Palace of the Hierarchs, I'm guessing they mean the Sanctum from Halo 2, so is instructed to greet the incoming Tartarus and inform that he'll soon be serving under another San Shayum, Ira Be'ar, the Prophet of Exquisite Devotion. When the two arrive, Truth joins them and Zoe is shooed into another room. Somewhat angered about his demotion of sorts, Zoe activates a listening device he had implanted in Truth's chair. I mean, hey, Zoe's a decent San Shayum, but he's still a San Shayum nonetheless. Anyway, Zo discovers what we as fans already know, that Truth plans to replace the Sanghili with Jural Hanai as the primary Covenant military force. Interesting to note is that this scene officially confirms the existence of the Chieftain of the Jural Hanai title. This was mostly a speculative title taken from a line of Tartaruses at the end of Halo 2. A bloody fate awaits you and the rest of your incompetent race. And I, Tartarus, Chieftain of the Brute, will send it and pseudo-confirmed in the Halo Encyclopedia. It seems the title is an artificial one that Truth bestowed upon Tartarus sometime during the Human Covenant War. Moving forward in light of this revelation, Zo feels he has no choice but to warn the Sanghili, and secretly meets with one he trusts, Gator Klemi. During this conversation, we also learn that Truth had given special orders to Jirul Hanai on Earth, a nice nod to Halo 3 ODST. 
We flash forward a bit as Katork lands on Delta Halo, he and a number of Sangheili escorting a few of the Sangheili counselors in preparation of the Great Journey. As they wait, it's mentioned that Tartarus had retrieved the Sacred Icon, though we of course know that he stole it after the Arbiter retrieved it. All is eerily silent until a Jural Hanai captain appears, leading a contingent of brute forces. Fighting breaks out, resulting in the death of almost all the Sangheili present. Katorik is saved only by the bodies of his fallen brethren when he's tossed over the edge of a bridge. On High Charity, Zoe Reskin meets with the Prophet of Exquisite Devotion, who knows of Zoe's betrayal. Zoe is initially forced to watch as Devotion tests a new gravity-based torture device on some of the remaining Sangheili counselors. Devotion actually uses it to squeeze the body fluid and organs out of a Sangheili like you would toothpaste from its container. The description is absolutely graphic, and it really makes you hate Devotion. Things only get worse when Zoe is ordered to take part as proof of his loyalty. Zoe refuses, and is sentenced to the same fate he just observed. Meanwhile, in the Usan system, in what is called the primary section of what remains of the refuge, the current Kaiden of the Usan Sanghili, Baltol Zealous, finds himself in a bit of a pickle. It's been over 3,000 years since his people had hidden from the Covenant, and things haven't exactly improved. Enduring Bias actually shut down within the lifetime of Usa due to wear and tear, the 15 surviving sections continue to break down, a mysterious blood sickness has found its way among his people, even killing his mate, and now a cultist is threatening his position. Baltol attempts a peaceful solution, but it seems none will be had. The leader of this cult, Kinsa, has the blood sickness, as do a few others that follow him. The sickness is known to drive its victims mad, meaning negotiations are out of the question. As time goes on, Kinsa's following grows, giving him control over a small number of sections, a few containing vital resources to the colony's survival. On high charity, Zoe is being escorted to his execution. Just before they enter, though, his Jural Hanai guards are ambushed by Sangheili, among them, Gatorik. With his saviors and a Huragog, Zoe escapes high charity just as Truth is taking off in the Forerunner Dreadnought. Taking a supply ship called, almost ironically, Journey Sustenance, so the Sangheili and the Huragog make a random jump. As fate would have it, they find themselves in the Usan system. Recognizing this from the writings of his ancestor, Zo convinces the Sangheili to let him search for the long-forgotten Usan colony. Within said colony, things have only been getting worse. It's been over 100 days since Baltol first confronted Kinsa, the year now being 2553, and the cultist is only growing in strength. With no other choice, Baltol authorizes a group to cut into a section where Kinsa is holed up. All seems to be going well initially, but it seems that Kinsa was aware of Baltol's activities and fighting breaks out. One Sangheili, Zalk Tilk, finds himself flung into the void of space. Of the two remaining of Baltol's forces, one is killed and the other, Kutzen, is captured. Using Kutzen's helmet cam, Baltol is able to challenge Kinsa to a float fight match, the winner taking claim as Kaiden of the refuge. Kinsa accepts. On Journey's sustenance, Zoe and crew are about to give up. News from Sanghelio says the truth is dead, the threat of the flood eliminated, and the Arbiter returning. We get a nod to Kilo 5 as Gatorik mentions that the Arbiter is trying to win over the Sanghili, keep by keep. Just as Zoe is about ready to give up, they finally stumble upon the Usan colony. They also find Zelk Tilk and bring him aboard. Communication proves difficult at first, 3,000 years of linguistic evolution, but a Covenant translation device quickly fixes the problem. Zelk and the former Covenant Sanghili exchange words, catching up on the situations at hand. And at Zelk's bequest, the group agrees to try and help the Usan colony and, by extent, Baltol Zealous. In Section 5 of the Refuge, Baltol and Kinsa get ready for their float fight match. Float fighting is a unique sport that evolved among the Usan colony, a zero-g fight in which two combatants, usually under a set of rules and not to the death, battle each other. But in this case, both sides are playing for keeps. The fighting starts with Kinsa having brought 11 people to Baltol's 10. Things don't exactly start out well for Baltol, partly because of Kinsa's cheating, and also because he's got the greatest float fighter on his side. Just as it seems that Baltol is going to lose, Enduring Bias shows up, killing Kinsa and a few of his forces, and giving Baltol his victory. Enduring Bias had been fixed by the Huragak, and not a moment too soon. With the arrival of the former Covenant Sanghili and the Sanshayun, plus the Huragak, pretty much all of the refuge's problems are now solvable. The blood sickness was the result of a malfunctioning protein synthesizer, and a cure is being developed for those who had it. Even more interesting is that, with the help of the Huragak, Enduring Bias is able to unite the sections of the refuge as it was always meant to be. The failsafe designed by the Forerunners would make it seem as though the shield world had been destroyed by explosion, and when it was saved, the remaining sections would reunite into a ring, a completed circle. Yes, this is why the book is called Broken Circle. Our story ends with Zoe deciding to remain on the refuge to study the Forerunner relics there, and the former Covenant Sangheili returning to their homeworld, along with any Usan Sangheili who wished to join them. 
So that's Broken Circle. It's an absolutely amazing read. It admittedly did have some problems, such as the Covenant species having nicknames identical to their human designations, Gerald Hanair Brood, Sanghili Elites, etc, etc. The pacing is a little off in some chapters, and I was a little disappointed that there are so many new mysteries with very little payoff, but overall it's a solid book. The real problem with it is that it's too short. So much more could have been told, perhaps allowing real advancement in regards to the lore. Still, what was done right is done extremely well. The characters are interesting, we get a great look at Sanchayum and Sanghili culture, and despite what I just said a moment ago, I do love the new mysteries. At many points, this book almost feels like an apology for the failings of Kilo 5. We learn so much more about Sanghili culture and Sanghelios in this book than we did through the three Kilo 5 books. I'm adding Halo Broken Circle to my list of must-read Halo novels, which admittedly is most of them, and I hope you do too. Broken Circle gets a 9 out of 10. Thanks for joining me as always, I hope I didn't bore you to death with so much information. Just as a reminder, I'll be streaming my legendary playthrough of the MCC starting at 10am Central Time on Wednesday, November 12th. Anyone who wants to join me is welcome to do so. Send me a message anytime I'm streaming, and if I have an opening, I'll send you an invite. First come, first serve. Anyway, see you Spartans and Elites on the battlefield. Hey guys, thanks for watching my video. It means a lot. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and maybe share it around on whatever social media you choose. Your support is greatly appreciated. I cannot stress that enough. Thanks for watching.